Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Programs broadcast. I'm Dr. Brad Reedy. Today is Thursday, June 23rd, 2022. The title of, uh, of tonight's broadcast is No Bad Parts. It is a book written by Richard Schwartz, where he explains what he has described and labeled the internal family systems model. So I'm going to get to that in just a moment. But before we start into that, I wanted to start with this point. It, it came up as I was reading the book, preparing for the broadcast, but also as I was thinking about our Finding You program. Um, I was watching a, a clip that came across my social media from the Joseph Campbell, Campbell Found Foundation. For those of you who don't know who Joseph Campbell is, he was a scholar who basically cataloged all the myths of, of all the cultures of all time and and came to the conclusion after studying all of them that there was just one story that was being told in all of them and he called it the hero's journey and it was this idea that the hero goes through a series of trials and travails after hearing the call and then comes out in the end maybe not with what he or she or they sought after but with a deeper connection to who they were and in a series of interviews just shortly before he died with Bill Moyers, who was a was a journalist, I think for NBC back in the day. I'm not quite sure. It might be ABC. He did a series of interviews, which eventually got turned into a series called The Power of Myth, and then became a book called The Power of Myth. And during one of those interviews, one of the clips that came across my social media this week, Bill Moyers said to Joseph Campbell as he was trying to explain something, Bill Moyers said, so whatever it is that we experience, we have to express it in language that is just not up to the occasion. And J Joseph Campbell smiled and said excitedly, that's it. That's what poetry is for. And he went on to explain more that it was not just poetry, but it was art, music. And, and really myth was a way of explaining the human experience and, and, and metaphor and, and symbols that, that transcended simple descriptions and language. So my thoughts leading into this broadcast tonight are, I do a lot of training of, of therapists and, and a lot of therapists, especially those that are new, are looking for models that, that tell them what to do. Right. That, that makes sense. It's a it's a, a terrifying experience to walk into a therapy room with a with a with a couple or with a client or a family and to have the, the burden to be able to somehow pull a rabbit out of the hat, to, to somehow shift dynamics that have kept often very intelligent, committed people stuck for some time. And as I was going over some some resources this week that we were talking about with our team about offering to our therapist, I said to one of my my therapists, I said, you know, I think people want it to be easy. The process of therapy, both on the therapist's part, but also on the client's part, they kind of want it to be easy. They want to be told what to do. And it's not. It's a it, it's a painful and difficult and a, and a, and a very, very long process. And as I start tonight to talk about a model that somebody's created, I'm going to reference this idea that he's created a, a set of language and a context and a model that he thinks explains human beings and how they operate and, and how they can transform and change and heal. But it is just a model. You know, when we think about, for example, Freud, you know, the, 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 the essentially the, the, the founder of psychotherapy, of psychology. The, the model that he presented, the id, the superego, the ego, those don't exist, right? We can't find them and touch them and see them. They are ideas, the defense mechanisms that we have of justifying or rationalizing um, or, or denial. Those are things that we do. And, and the, the model becomes kind of a myth. What I love about the myths of psychology is I love that they offer compassion and understanding and one of the things that, that Richard Schwartz does well in his book, and I think is at the heart of his work, is, you know, the title says it all, No Bad Parts, is that, that there's the parts of us that, that are self-sabotaging, that are causing us and others pain. We, want, we might want to be angry with them or punish them. That's what we were taught. That's how we were taught to respond to, to people and situations and behavior that hurt us with, with anger and with, with a sword, so to speak. But, but what we learn from psychotherapy, what we learn from attachment-based therapy, what and, and, and in a sense, there's a lot of attachment-based principles in Richard Schwartz's his book. Um, we learn that compassion is a better facilitator of healing and change 
than is anger or, or hatred or, or shame. And, and when I think about that in the context of the intensives we do, I know I announce it at the end of every broadcast, but I, I want to say this as clearly and, and, and emphatically as I can. I don't think there's a better thing that you can do for yourself than to enter some type of psychotherapy with somebody who makes it their goal to find and understand you, not fix you, not merely reduce your symptoms, although reducing your symptoms is what happens when you find yourself. Eventually, the symptoms slowly, slowly, um, they, they, they have no purpose anymore because you, you've come into contact with who you are and you've dealt with the traumas, the pain that has been unfelt, unexpressed, that has been somewhere stuck in your psyche, your unconscious, or your body. Um, but that treating those things, responding to those things with empathy and understanding in psychotherapy is, is, is kind of a reparative experience of the childhood experience, right? The therapist, in essence, for a short period of time, takes the position of the parent. And how they think and feel about you, how they treat you, becomes the stuff which heals you. And, and I, I've talked a lot. I make it a point to mention that I've been in psychotherapy with my current therapist for 23 years and somewhere around five to 10 years beyond that at other points in my life, I went to therapy. Um, that is to say that it's a lifelong process. The process of becoming who you are, one famous psychologist said, said is the hardest work of all. And, and finding you, specifically finding you, even more than finding family or finding connection for couples. The work of finding you is, in my opinion, a great springboard. I brought that, that idea of finding you to life from my own work. All that I've done, all that I've seen with families, with, with children in wilderness therapy over the years, with, with the, the treatment of, of, of individuals suffering or suffering sort of empathically with, with those in their life that are hurting themselves, all that I've learned tells me and suggests that doing your own work is the, the, the royal road to, to enlightenment, to healing, to greater peace and confidence and clarity. And the research bears it out. What I love about the book, uh, Parenting from the Inside Out by Daniel Siegel and Mary, Mary Hartzell. And Daniel Siegel is probably the most famous and, and, and respected um, medical doctor in the country that talks about neurology and psychiatry and child development from UCLA, he brings to light in his book with Mary Hartzell, Parenting from the out, Inside Out, uh, hard scientific evidence to show that the greatest predictor of in, in improving your quality of relationships with people, specifically with your child, providing them the kind of um, response and context that they need to heal. This, this can be something you do preventatively or something you do in terms of treatment, the greatest thing you could do is do your own work. And the connection between understanding your history, understanding yourself, being aware and more conscious of, of who you are provides you with a foundation that you can connect to others. One of the things that Richard Schwartz says in his book, and I'll, I'll read it later in the slide presentation this, this evening, is that how we look at ourselves, how we think about the parts of ourselves, how we relate to them, will have a direct impact on the people in our lives that we come across who in some ways um, are similar to those parts of us. So that's a long preamble, but I, I felt passionate about saying it. To begin, everything in this, this slide deck is a quote from the book, No Bad Parts by Richard Schwartz. He writes, at its core, IFS, Internal Family Systems, is a loving way of relating internally to your parts and externally to the people in your life. So in a sense, IFS, Internal Family Systems, is a life practice as well. It's something you can do on a daily, moment-to-moment -moment basis at any time by yourself or, or with others. His idea is that the energies inside of us, our defenses, our wounded and burdened, traumatized parts, um, the parts of us that, that protect us and, and defend against threats, all those parts he, he personifies into roles. He calls them sacred beings. And really his practice is, is kind of a guided meditation. 
I'm going to talk about some of the things about his model that I that I don't like, as well as some of the things that I think are the strengths. I think one one part that I don't like is that he oversimplifies. I always worry about oversimplifying therapy. Anytime you're speaking and teaching about psychotherapy or, or psychology or mental health issues, you, you run the risk of over, oversimplifying it. And really, it's the most complex thing that we could possibly imagine. The human brain, the human psyche, the human experience is, is, is an infinite experience. And, and I think he simplifies it a little bit too much. And he talks about these, these beings being sacred beings, being real characters inside of you. And in a sense, I think that the guided imagery that he takes his readers through and, and teaches his practitioners to practice with their clients is probably too simple and too conscious. I think one of the most important parts about psychotherapy is that we take into consideration the vast ocean of energy that is unconscious. And, and to get to a, a level of awareness with some of that, like I said, takes a lot of years. And no short-term therapy, in my opinion, in my experience, can accomplish that. In fact, I was reading a, a, the, the Middle Passage, a, a book by James Hollis, who I think is an absolute genius. And he was describing something I thought to be really interesting. He was saying, on average, the average man in society, in our culture, takes about a year in psychotherapy just to get to the starting point of where the average woman is in terms of their ability to feel feelings. Think about that. And I think there's some wisdom in that, in the way that we've been um, shaped by our culture. His suggestion, and I, I don't know that it's literally true at a year, but but talking about the the woundedness uh, that, that men experience as part of the the, the patriarchy, we we see how women and dis, disenfranchised franchise folks can suffer, and children can suffer from patriarchy, but men suffer from it too. And he says, with our culture, it takes a year for a man just to get to the starting point of where the average woman is. And so when you start talking about parts and he guides you directly to protector parts and exiled parts and firefighters and managers, these various parts that he has labels and names for, um, that takes a long time in my experience. I've been to nine, I think it was about nine intensives myself as a participant. Like I said, that's where I got the idea for, for our program is from doing my own work and my own intensive programs let alone my own therapy. Um, and, and my ability to connect to parts of myself, the, 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 you know, the inner child, the, 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 the historical me, if you will. It takes years and I get better at it. So in that sense, he's right that it's a practice, I think. But I think the way that he describes it, especially the way that he practices it and teaches therapists to practice, practice it, I think it's a little condescending to, to us that we can just access those parts of ourself and start asking them to communicate or step aside or let us, you know, let us attend to the exiled part of us that is wounded and hurting and suffering. He talks about this idea of the monomind. In some ways, some of his language is actually opposite of what most psychotherapy talks about. You know, he talks about blending our parts as a bad thing, whereas in psychology, often integration is a good thing. And, and he, again, part of his limitation is it sounds like he was he was educated in systems theory and not in psychology primarily. I was I myself was educated in systems theory. I have a PhD in marriage and family therapy and a master's degree in marriage and family therapy. And the religion of marriage, marriage and family therapy taught us that individual psychotherapy is a mistake. That's what I was indoctrinated into, and it was it was it was kind of a religious feeling to it. Like you had to believe that in my study, and that to treat a person individually and then send them back into a, a, a you know marriage or family was to underserve them. And he has this belief that treating um, you know, treating systems externally and then taking that idea and putting it inside of yourself, thinking of yourself as a, a, a group of people, a family of people serving different roles, that that's how you treat it. And the mono mind for him is the false idea that we have that we are just one person. And so he likes the idea of breaking things apart in our internal internal world so we can talk about how we relate to those, our, our symptoms, right? Our, our wounds and how they can be embodied in characters that we can visualize in our minds. That That's the model. He writes, the monomind paradigm has caused us to fear our parts and view them as pathological. 
I don't agree with that, but that's his claim. In our attempts to control, he says, what we consider to be disturbing thoughts or emotions, we just end up fighting, ignoring, disciplining, hiding, or feeling ashamed of those impulses that keep us from doing what we want to do in our lives. And then we feel, and then we shame ourselves for not being able to control them. Again, the, the, the idea of compassion based therapy, the idea of non judgment, I think is, is, is central and critical to psychotherapy and to healing. That's the, the fundamental energy that, a, that an attachment based therapist like myself tries to practice and bring into therapy, no matter how disturbing the behavior can be. You know, the Buddhists offer a great model, a great, a great way of thinking about ourselves in this way. Thich Nhat Hanh, the teacher that I love to read from, would say, we look at our depression, we look at our, our, our anxiety like we would a crying baby and we hold it and we tell it that we're here for it. It's, it's, it's a visualization, right? It's a practice um, that we, would, we can imagine in our minds and, and that can bring some kind of healing or some kind of warmth and self-compassion to us. I'm not going to go into great deal detail in the model because, again, you can read the book if you want. I, I don't recommend the book, per se. Um, it's not going to be you know our model. I think there's things to borrow from it, but any one model in attachment theory um, runs the risk of eclipsing the therapist. And I, I wanted to say that to you tonight. That's maybe more important than the specific model. People ask me all the time, you know, do you recommend a, a dialectical behavioral therapist, a cognitive behavioral therapist, um, a reality therapist, um, an, an emotionally um, emotionally focused therapist? Uh, 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 this is an, an internal family systems therapist. And, and my point is, there are there's wisdom and skills and tools from ideas and ideas from all of those models that can be helpful. But when one when one has to commit themselves to one model as the full explanation for how human beings operate and how they change, the client either has to get go along with it or they get lost. You know, an attachment-based therapist, for example, might offer you a, a guided meditation the same way that an IFS therapist would offer you. But if you responded and said, you know, that doesn't fit for me or that's not the way that I think of myself or I can't do that exercise, the attachment-based therapist would drop it and then find something that worked for you. In this model, he kind of tries to control it, right? It has to be a certain way. It has to fit. And, and, the, and the client has to get in line with him. He talks about managers. Managers are those parts of us, those characters in us, the way that he talks about it. Um, they're protectors of the system. They attempt to keep the person in control of every situation and relationship in order to protect him or her or them from feeling hurt or rejected. They can be a controller, a striver, a caretaker, a judge. They can be passive, a pessimist a planner, a self-criticizer, that's the managers. And again, you're going to hear in some of the descriptions, he's talking about defenses. He's talking about what, what analysts or attachment-based therapists would talk about when they're talking about defense mechanisms. Firefighters also protect the system. That's another category. Firefighters also protect the system, but act after the exiles. That's the lost or hurt and hurt parts of ourselves. After exiles are upset, to either soothe them or distract them. Any activity can be used to get away from exiles, but common ones include addictions, sleep, work, sex, diet, exercise, computer, video games, etc. Binge eating, suicidality, self-harm, violence, dissociation, distraction, obsession, compulsion, fantasy, and rage. So he split up the fences into two types, really. And the firefighters are more like the symptoms, the self-medicating symptoms. The exiles are the parts of us that hold painful, or the characters, according to him, in us that hold painful emotions that have been isolated from the conscious self for protection of the system for the part's safety. They become increasingly they become increasingly extreme in an effort to be cared for and share their story. They carry burdens from being wound, wounded. They feel like dependency, shame, worthlessness, fear, terror, grief, loss, loneliness, neediness, and pain. You know, that, that's the wound, the wounded parts of us. And then he talks about the self, the one, and, and his whole idea is that we can be self-directed. We can become the one that, that manages all of this, that has relationships with all of these parts, respects and understands the purpose that they serve, but in, in essence is the leader of this whole gang of, of folks inside of us. The self is who we are. It's the core, the center of the person. When that self is activated and differentiated, 
it acts as an active compassionate leader it, it, and he talks about the the eight c's i believe is what he lists them as when you are in yourself there will be energy that will be calm curious compassionate connected confident creative courageous and and, and clear clarity and, and i again i think that that his model of describing things it resonates with some of the other models out there it can make some sense talking about change you know the motivation for change he writes we often find that the harder way harder we try to get rid of emotions and thoughts the stronger they become this is because parts like people fight back against being shamed or exiled if you self medicate as a, if you're, if you're firefighters, how he would say it again, he talks about it like they are literal beings. If your firefighter who, who is in, ingesting alcohol and, and drugs is medicating against the pain, that exiled, wounded, abused, lost child will start to act out louder and louder and louder. We'll make a mess of things to try to get the attention of, of the self and to try to be attended to. Again, it's a model that has some poetry to it some art to it. He said three areas that, that he made discovery about parts. He said, even the most destructive parts have protective intentions. And that's, again, that's the same thing that attachment theory and Sigmund Freud came up with in the first place, that those parts of us that are protecting us from pain that is too overwhelming, too unspeakable, that there's no safe place to share it, that they have, we can have compassion and understanding and even respect for them. Parts are often frozen in past traumas when their extreme roles were needed. If we needed to, for example, not feel angry, there would be a lost, aching part of us that wasn't able to express angry and it remains frozen in this helpless, scared, eight-year-old, 13-year-old, four-year-old place inside of us. When they trust it's safe to step out of their roles, they are highly, highly valuable to the system. Again, he's talking about bringing conscious awareness. I think it's a, I think it's a, a kind of a, an exercise, an intellectual exercise, a thought experiment is what Einstein would have called it, right? This way of thinking about ourselves that can help us respond, react, understand ourselves. He actually quotes a few people that I really, that I really, really, really respect. He, he quotes Charles Eisenstein. He quotes Robert Bly. Robert Bly specifically wrote, wrote uh, an essay that was contained in a book called Meeting the Shadow, which is one of the books that changed my life. Um, he quotes the, the quote from G uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow that I often call, quote, talking about how if we could read the history of our enemies, we would find compassion for them, right? We would, we would lose our hostility toward them. So in that way, it's, it's, if, it, you know, if it works, it works. I, I, I've been suggested to read this book for some time. Um, hadn't felt the pull, but I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to give it a try because one too many people recommended it to me. Um, and it has some value in terms of the way, a way of conceptualizing human beings. Not the way that I do, not the way that I will going forward, but, but I can imagine for some people it could really resonate with them. It's a story. And if that story resonates with you, then, then great. He writes, when I asked these protective parts what they'd rather do, what they'd rather do if they trusted they didn't have to protect, they often wanted to do something opposite of the role that they were in. The inner critics wanted to become cheerleaders or sage advisors. Extreme caretakers wanted to help set boundaries. Rageful parts wanted to help with discerning who was safe. It seemed that not only were their parts, um, not only were parts not what they seemed, but also each had qualities and resources to bring to the client's life that were not available while they were tied up in these protective roles. That's absolutely true. You know, what, what is our, 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 our weakness becomes our gift. What is our pitfall becomes our mountaintop. I love the quote in, in the preface of mere Christianity written by CS Lewis, where he says, you know, I'm only going to talk about things that I know something about, have experience with. He said, I can't talk about gambling, for example, because I have no experience with gambling. Neither do I, he explains, this is the genius, neither do I, he says, have any experience of the virtue of which gambling is the excess, like a willingness to take risks. 
right? Willingness to jump off a bungee tower. He doesn't say that exactly, but that idea. So there's a, there's the, the, the problem with it is it's too simple. And as he takes you through even case studies and, and talks about how it works with people, and he has some transcripts that I think are acted out in the book or retold in the book. I listened to the audio book. Um, you get the sense that the therapist knows the right way and what needs to happen and how it needs to happen. And what, what he, what, what it feels like to me is he doesn't take into account that clients want to make the therapist feel good about themselves. One of the most respected statements I ever heard from a, a therapist who came up with a model brain spotting specifically David Grand, Dr. David Grand, who was trained in attachment based therapy to begin with. He said, if the therapist does not take into consideration the client's impulse to please the therapist, therapy will not progress to an effective end. If you can't tell your therapist what you don't like and what doesn't work, and they're not willing to switch gears to apologize for the miss, you don't have an adequate psychotherapist, family therapist, individual therapist, couples therapist. If your therapist doesn't know how to apologize when they hurt your feelings, when they upset you, when they miss you, you don't have a therapist who's showing up as an adult. Yeah, the, there's, a, there's a phrase that one of my therapists taught me recently, and I really like this idea. I was explaining and teaching that in psychotherapy, you, you try to not ask questions that have a right answer. We're not interested in a right answer. Now, you can ask questions for comprehension to see if somebody understood you. That, that's fine. Ask them to explain it back or what they got out of it. If you're talking about comprehension, that's, that's acceptable if you're trying to teach a concept or a principle. But outside of that limited slice, you don't want to ask questions that have right answers. And you can feel this in his work, that he's taking people on a path and they know what he wants to hear and they say what he wants to hear. And in that way, it feels... Reading this book from the position of a client, not a psychotherapist, I, I feel like I'm in, in kindergarten. And I'm being condescended to and told how I should think, feel, and, and, and behave. The difference in evoke in our model is the biggest difference. And I read, a, I actually studied a couple of folks this week, is that when psychotherapy focuses on what to do, it misses the whole point. Evokes psychotherapy, our model. I talked about this a couple of broadcasts ago, ago uh, when I, when I talked on the evoke clinical vision, our goal is for you to figure out who you are to become your most authentic self, the self that was lost due to trauma and fears and shame and, and should and shouldn't. So again, psychotherapy that focuses on doing rather than who you are. In, in our version of psychotherapy, in Joseph Campbell's model, the heroic journey is becoming who you are. That's what all the myths are about, according to Campbell. They're, they're symbolically, metaphorically, using story and, and, and imagery. They are about becoming our, our, our brightest, most authentic, most courageous. A lot of the adjectives that he used to describe the self. Curious, compassionate selves. And doing things can help, right? When I was in 10th grade, before I dropped out of high school, when I was in 10th grade, there was a quote on the board. I've quoted it in my books from, um, I think it was from Orson Welles. And it said, if language can corrupt thought, excuse me, if thought can corrupt language, in other words, if what we think can affect what we say, then so can language corrupt our thought. What we say can, can change how we, we think. I do believe in that, that sometimes practicing a skill Practicing yoga, meditation, can change who we are, can, can downregulate the nervous system, can give us access to parts of ourselves that, that we don't have access to when we feel threatened or unsafe. But, but fundamentally, Evoke's model is for the children, for the, for the couple, 
for the individual to become their authentic self. And that change gives them a tremendous amount of peace and calmness and, and relief from suffering. And by the way, it I, I can't say this too much. It, it puts them in a position to be able to love their partner and their child in ways that the, that the partner and the child need and want. I thought this was an interesting quote. He said, the big conclusion here is that parts are not what they have been commonly thought to be. They're not cognitive adaptations or sinful impulses. Psychologists, therapists don't believe that that um, parts are sinful impulses. Even Freud, in fact, he referenced Freud, Freud and said that's essentially what Freud thought. That's not what Freud thought. Um, instead, parts are sacred spiritual beings, and they deserve to be treated as such. I, I like the idea. Again, if you can turn yourself into a, a group of sacred beings that you love and the part of you that wants to self-medicate, you can love. And the part of you that wants to fight with your partner when you get accused of making a mistake, you can love that part. The part of you that wants to flip the, the, the car driver next to you and the car next to you when they cut you off, if you can love that part, I believe the world would be a better place. And then you would end up being more capable of loving people in your life that show up and sound like those parts. Are they literally sacred beings? That's not the way that I see the world paradigmatically. I listed the, the guided meditations that he, that he takes you through in the book. I'm not going to go over all of them, but he talks about getting to know a protector, mapping out your parts, the fire drill, un, un, unblending and, and, and embodying. Um, that's a that's a it's interesting. That's a typo that I have on here that I thought I, I I cut and paste from from the book itself. But again, his idea is that that blending us and thinking of ourselves as one person is a problem, and so we need to separate ourselves out into these parts. I, I think part of that again is he he sees that as a, a de shaming technique. That if I can look at this this one part that might be making a mess of our lives as not part of the core self, then the core self isn't threatened and shamed. I think that that's part of the, the separation instinct that he has and that, that he, that he can understand how to work with that. Those groups of what I would call the groups of impulses. He disagrees, but what I would call the groups of impulses or instincts or trauma responses. He has a dilemma meditation, working with a challenging protector, a daily uh, internal family systems meditation. There's a pathway where the self leaves parts at, at a trailhead and takes a path up the mountain by themselves. Um, a sad person meditation, advanced parts mapping, working with triggers, advanced protector work and body meditation. Again, all of these are just guided meditations where you're visualizing literally characters that look like you, but that have certain roles, rigid, fixed roles that they play in the context of mental health and mental illness suffering. And if you can talk to those folks in your mind, if you can have dialogues with them, he asks you to talk to them. He asks you to invite them to stay behind or to get out of the way, or can I have permission to talk to the, the exiled child? And again, there's, there's bits of wisdom in, in there because, for example, if a therapist opens somebody up, any psychotherapist opens somebody up and, and, and touches on a, a traumatic memory, a traumatic experience that's stored in the, the, the body, the psyche, the brain. It would not be uncommon at all for that person after the session's over when they're by themselves to feel horrible shame, to feel angry, to feel betrayed. I, I call it a, a, a vulnerability hangover. I love this quote. The way we relate to our parts translates directly to how we relate to people when they resemble our parts. That's the basic thesis of the audacity to be you, is that the relationship we have with ourself is a, a template for the relationship that we have with everybody else. And again, those, those, have, those have been covered in attachment theory and psychodynamic theory. That's about projecting. You know, if you heal, if you know how to respond to your inner child, one of the things I do at our intensives, we do an inner child exercise at our intensives. One of the things I do when you imagine yourself traveling back in time and talking to your six-year-old self, your 10-year-old self, or what have you, you get to choose the time. 
I ask people, what do you think that the child needs from you? And, and part of what I want to hear people say is, I want to know if they know, if they even have an idea of what it means to be nurturing and protective of a child. And most people have no experience with it. That's the truth. Almost nobody has experience with, some do, and I, I, I'm happy and, and I envy their, their life's experience, but most people don't know that you listen to the child. You ask it questions. You don't lecture. It. You don't try to soothe it by telling them it's going to be okay. You show them it's going to be okay by listening to their story and containing it, not being triggered by it, not panicking or, or freaking out or shutting it down or getting angry at it. And so again, I think that there are exercises and bits and pieces of his of his model that definitely can be utilized by people. We use some of it. So here's my take home for this evening. Whatever works for you is what works for you. And and aside from giving you a, a summary introduction to internal family systems and, and the book No Bad Parts. I want to empower you to, 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 I'm going to invite you to at least once risk being your authentic self with your therapist and tell them what you don't like, what, what, what you're not okay with. I think that's the best litmus test to, to discover whether or not you have an adequate therapist. See, I teach, I teach our, our therapists that if you get lucky enough, this is this goes for our wilderness program and for an intensive program, for our intensive program. If you get lucky enough for as a therapist for a client to confront you, you have the opportunity to do something different probably than they've ever experienced in their life. You thank them, you welcome it, you, you tell them how what an honor it is that they would risk telling you the, you the truth. And the risk is that you're going to do to them what the other adults in their lives have done to them, the other authority figures have done to them. Which, by the way, most therapists do re-traumatize the client. Most therapists will, because of their own defense, because their own the, their lack of work, will make the client wrong. We'll explain how the client's reaction, feeling, interpretation of what the therapist did is misguided, probably based on some kind of pathology or trauma they experienced from others. I've sat with children who've gone through the treatment process, and I've heard them tell me stories just like that. I had a boy once tell me that he, he learned that his distrust of the therapists that his belief that people who express love and affection for him were just trying to get something from him. I had him tell me that he, he was told that that was a crazy, mixed up cognitive distortion, a thinking error. Of course, knowing his family as well as I did, I had the exact op opposite response. I said, I can completely understand why you think that. Because your parents have had a lot of anxiety Your experience that when people express love, they're trying to get something from, from you for them, which is what anxious people do. They try to get comfort, take it from others. They hold other people responsible for their internal state. So, um, he talks about and I agree with this, compassion is a better motivator for change than fear and punishment. I think that's the best, for me, that's the, the biggest take home. Listening to yourself is a pathway to greater peace, clarity, confidence, and often results in a reduction in symptomology. Absolutely. Um... I like the idea of working with your therapist. That's probably where I differ a little bit. Somebody wrote a comment on there that I just observed that said that 
you're surprised that I'm talking about a, a, a book that I might not be fully endorsing. And I, I debated that actually. On a couple of occasions, I, I usually uh, schedule a book review and then I read the book afterwards. Somebody recommended it or I like the title or like the basic premise and I schedule the, the, the broadcast and then I read the book. So I'm kind of tied into it. On a couple of occasions, I just changed the, the title of, of the broadcast at the last minute without commenting on it. I, I think this one is, is, is hit and miss. I think it's got some some pieces. I think as an overall model, I think it falls short like all, like all overall models do of how to change people, how to fix people. And I also wanted to use it to say to you, you know, I remember my favorite book that, that's written about children in the history of books that I've ever read, The Drama of the Gifted Child, which if you, if you listen to me, you're sick of me saying that, but that's my favorite book. I think it's the most important book ever written about children. I remember sitting in front of my therapist after reading it for the second or third time, revisiting it. And I remember disagreeing about something with my therapist. And my therapist said, of course you might know something that Alice Miller didn't know. Decades have elapsed since she, she wrote that book. And then he made the, she made the point that I, I was, I, I resonated with me so deeply. She said, Alice Miller would actually welcome your disagreement. And I believe that to be true. I was talking to somebody from the Joseph Campbell Foundation today, actually. Somebody who sits on the board. And, you know, I, I was saying it's not so much Joseph Campbell. He's irrelevant to me. But what he taught was gold for the soul. And, and the, 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 the gentleman that I was talking to said, Joseph would agree with you. It wasn't about him. His name, who he is, is irrelevant. He was just bringing information, just truth to the world. And, and, and that, again, it goes back to therapists. If you, if, you, if you can't disagree, if your disagreement with a parent, with an authority figure, with a therapist is threatening to them, that they have to defend themselves and make you wrong and re-explain it and essentially gaslight you, you don't have a good one. So I, I debated, I have to admit. Um, I have to admit that I was conflicted about whether or not to follow through with this, but... I thought there was enough reading about it and that I could teach you this principle. So you work with your therapist. I challenge you to, um, I challenge you to tell your therapist when you don't like something or don't agree with something as a way of not just to test them, but in essence, to see if they can be adult enough. Because if they're adult enough, they'll just say something along the lines of, I'm sorry. I'm so glad that you told me. Thanks for telling me. I'll try to do better. Or yes, that was a mistake. And that's what I think working with your therapist is about. But if their model has to be true, I'm, 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 I'm about ready to write a, a, another book. And it's about a training manual. I want to write a training manual, which is very difficult given my model because any fray, if I, if I come up with bullet points about a way to approach a client or an issue or a situation, those have to be disposable because the client is more important than my theoretical model, my seven bullet points for change, my three, three principles for attachment-based therapy. There is no generic solution or technique. This is not easy work. This is a life's work. And therapists and programs like the intensives can be tools that you use to do your work along the way. But they themselves are not the answer or the truth. They're just tools along the way. Does the therapist's model eclipse the client? Does it become more important at defending the model? I asked that at a training with a, with a therapist that I respected immensely, with a model that I respected immensely. I gave a counterexample, asked, asked it in the form of a question, to one of their main premises of their of their model. And instead of hearing my 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 challenge and, and trying to see what how it might have fit or not, they had to defend the model because they were teaching the model. And the model is the way that they see the world. Does the therapist's model eclipse the client? 
The, and using guided imagery as a way of understanding our subconscious parts can be an effective tool. We do meditations that are intensive. We do guided meditations that are intensive. We visualize the inner child. We visualize going back and talking to your parents when you were 12 years old or 15 years old or six years old. We do it and in, 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 we embody it in, with using real people as role players. But those kinds of exercises can be useful. And over time, you can begin to access. The last intensive that I participated in, and this is true of the last few, I don't need a lot of prompts. I just simply say, the last one I said, I want my third born child, I want my grandfather, and I want my dog. And those are the people that I'm going to talk to. And I have something I need to say to each one of them. And it was incredibly emotional. But that took 20 years of psychotherapy and eight previous, uh, you know, attendance at eight previous in intensives before that. Intensive work is a great immersion, jumpstart, accelerator into this process. All right, I'm happy to take any questions, comments, disagreements, arguments, whatever works, whatever works. Somebody says, having been to three intensives, I have found IFS to be in line with the psychodrama we do. It is very similar. I know I'm just one. I guess I am disagreeing and I want to share it with him. Oh, absolutely. I find so much of it in line also. I want to be clear about that. The conceptual... There's a way of conceptualizing thing, and then there's a way of operating as a psychotherapist. I wrote an article. In fact, I can... Can I share a link? I think I can. I can attach a file. Oh, it has to be in my... If you Google my name, psychotherapy and or, or psychology and therapy, Brad Reedy, you can find the article written in a journal a few years ago, 2018, I think. Um, conceptualizing something psychologically and psychotherapy are, are two different things. I think his model has a lot of utilitarian usefulness to it. It's it it mirrors a lot of what we do. My daughter loves thinking about intensives in the form of this. I, I, I agree with that. I, I'm online. I think at, at times it's just about the, 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 it becomes a dogma. It becomes a should. It becomes kind of inflexible at times. It becomes, this will work for everybody at times. When I walk into a therapy session, I have some model, some preferred ways of talking and being, but part of my goal is to be flexible enough to allow the, 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 the client to Bring what works for them to the table too. Thanks for sharing the link. Any other comments, Malia, before I go over to the announcements? Yeah, the psychology link is, is above. Thank you. All right, but folks, my two books, The Journey of the Rogue Parent and The Audacity of You are both on Audible and Amazon. Somebody writes, I always hear you talking about finding a good therapist that has done his or her work. How does that, how does one go to find a good therapist? Word of mouth? I don't think you know until you're in therapy and you challenge them, frankly. You, you, I have, I think I have a, a, um, a post that talks about seven ways to know if you have a good therapist. That, that's the, the measure. In the Audacity of You, I talk about psychotherapy in one of the chapters. What to look for in a therapist. Look for a therapist who looks for you. Look for a therapist who looks to understand you, not fix you. Look for a therapist who can be wrong. Look for a therapist that doesn't need to defend themselves being a good therapist. Look for a therapist who welcomes your disagreements. You know, the, the catch-all umbrella that I talk about is attachment-based therapy, which is a very loose term because there's no real theory called attachment-based therapy. It's just understanding humans and understanding the reparative experience that happens between the therapist and the client is is a is a opportunity for for healing attachment traumas, developmental traumas, even historical big T traumas. So my two books are available on Amazon and, and Audible. If you want to give back to people who can't afford therapy, choose mentalhealth.org, sky's the limit fund.org, or evoke family foundation.org are our charitable partners. We have support groups for current and alumni wilderness families. June 30th is the next available one, 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. We have one a month that's just for alumni of our wilderness program. June 28th, 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time is the next one for that. And then we have once a month intensives alumni 
support groups, July 12th, 6 p.m. for that. Contact Malia at evoketherapy.com for any information on that. If you want to do a deep dive into the intensive, July 14th is the next available offering. Again, I've said enough about it, but I think it's the best way to help your relationships is to understand yourself. And I think the research and, and the science and my my personal experience with with it is that the, the 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 dilemmas that you brought to parenting the dilemmas that you brought to relationships existed before you met those folks they might become solidified or cemented or amplified in those relationships that's that's absolutely likely to be true and there can be new traumas and, and new energies that come from that relationship but the seeds were there before and it's so you can find them July 14th is your next available offering in person or August 26th through 28th online. And then I'll be conducting another returning to you. If you've been to a finding you and you want to come back, returning to you October 12th through 16th. Intensives at evoketherapy.com is the place to go for that. We have coaches that are trained in our model, attachment-based coaches that are trained in attachment-based therapy that provide life coaching, couples coaching, parent coaching, individual coaching. Just contact coaching at evoketherapy.com. We have um, pursuits trips that are experiential activities, trips customized all over the world, any kind of activity, virtually, any kind of activity, and, and, and it's facilitated and supported with by, by therapeutic staff. So think Therapy Light or Sober Fun for, for families or for young adults, or for adults for that matter, not so young. We invite all current families to go to six 12-step support groups. Any combination of alanon.org, coda.org, familiesanonymous.org, or adultchildren.org are places you can go to find out more or find out meeting times or even attend virtual meetings. RefugeRecovery.org is a Buddhist-inspired recovery program, less of an emphasis on a higher power. And then the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI.org, also has local classes and resources in your area. All of these broadcasts are available on Spotify or your favorite podcast app. Just go to your podcast app or, or Spotify and search Finding You on Evoke Therapy Podcast or go to soundcloud.com and search the same thing. You can also find us on our on our YouTube channel, Evoke's YouTube channel. If you want to watch it and see the slides and see my face, uh, you can go to our YouTube channel. Um, you can find Evoke Therapy programs and me, Dr. Brad Reedy, on Twitter and Instagram using the handles at Evoke Therapy or at Dr. Brad Reedy, um, respectively at D-R-B-R-A-D-R-E-E-D-Y. You can find intensives, our intensives program on Instagram using the handle of Ad Evoke Therapy Intensives. And on Facebook, you can find us by searching either Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives. And then the Evoke Therapy blog has content curated and supported by Malia, who also moderates for me. She does a wonderful job of getting our staff and therapists and the Evoke family to, to create some wonderful content for you all. I'm going to be, oh, actually, I have one more, don't I? I have one more broadcast before my before my July vacation. I think I have one um, next week. Is it Wednesday? Is that what it is, Malia? Uh, we'll announce it. We'll send it out. Anyway, folks, um, thanks for sharing all of 629 is when, when it's at. So I think, yeah, 629, that is Wednesday of next week. All right, folks, thanks for joining me. I hope it's helpful. I hope it's a helpful point of contact for and in behalf of the people that you love and that love you. Thank you for being willing to do your work and show up to things like this. Keep doing it. It is a life's practice. And on the other side is greater joy and connection and peace and clarity. Have a great evening. Take care and I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.